Ani and good day. My name is Adele Loosemore and I'm a Treaty Indian from Shibonini. In this short video, we're going to look at the word half-breed. Did it have the same meaning as the word Métis? The Métis Nation of Ontario thinks it did. Well, here's some historical evidence that you might want to consider. MNO's verified Métis family documents about our ancestors were approved by their registrar in 2017. I'm also showing you MNO's 2019 description of a documented Métis. It leaves out a couple of words that were in the 2017 one, but you can see that it means the same thing. If, in some old record, someone called one of your ancestors a half-breed, that's good enough. Your ancestor is now a documented Métis. MNO's registry policy of 2019 explains the next steps. The requirements for membership in the Métis Nation of Ontario do not relate to a distinct Métis identity or to a historic Métis community. Applicants just need a genealogical connection to any mixed ancestry person that lived in the Métis Nation homeland shown in this map, meaning that the ancestor must have lived somewhere, almost anywhere in Ontario at some point in the last couple of centuries. In a different video series, I'll be talking about the 1840 half-breed petition in detail. For this video, I want to show you how government officials reacted to it. The half-breeds at Penetanguishene wanted to receive Indian presence just like the half-breeds at Sault Ste. Marie did. The civil secretary wrote to Mr. Jarvis, the superintendent of Indian Affairs, to ask his opinion on the issue. That's Jarvis's picture on the screen. He wrote back to Harrison to say that the Indian department didn't want half-breeds to continue receiving presents, but it is extremely difficult to decide in many cases who are or who are not of that caste. So Jarvis is saying it's hard to tell the half-breeds from the full-blooded Indians. Then Jarvis says, the determination to withhold presence from this class of Indians was, I believe, first acted upon during the administration of Sir Peregrine Maitland. Notice he calls the half-breeds this class of Indians. The picture on the screen now shows Sir Peregrine Maitland in his uniform. He was Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada in the 1820s. Here's Jarvis's picture on the screen again. In his letter, Jarvis continues to explain that keeping presents from half-breeds was supposed to discourage the intermarriage of French-Canadian or other white men with Indian women. It was thought that these marriages had a demoralizing effect on the Indian character and retarded their civilization. Jarvis goes on to say that he disagrees with that belief and he says, if this is the only reason for withholding presents from half-breeds, I certainly think the sooner this disability is removed from the half-breeds, the better. So the superintendent of Indian Affairs thinks that half-breeds should be receiving Indian presents. Now Harrison and his wife are pictured on the screen. Harrison sends Jarvis's remarks to Lieutenant Governor John Colborne. 
and Harrison also writes a letter of his own to give to Colborn, and it says, in part, so long as the present system of giving presents at all is pursued, it is not easy to discover why a difference should be made between Indians of a pure race and the half-breeds. Very few of the resident Indians in the old settled parts of the province who receive expenditures from government are of the pure Indian race. So Harrison is noting that in part of the province, mixed ancestry Indians are benefiting from government money just like the full-blooded people are. But the petition from the half-breeds of Penetanguishene is not successful. Two years later, in 1842, the Lieutenant Governor, John Colborne, pictured here, sends a message through T.G. Anderson, the Superintendent of Indian Affairs. Colborne has found out that the Indian Department is still giving presents to half-breeds and he's got something to say about that. He made these rules. No Indian woman or her children who lives with a white man shall receive presents. And if she separate from her husband, though she may be entitled as an Indian woman to receive, her children will not unless they may be in every respect abandoned by their father and are brought up as pure Indians in the tribe to which the mother belongs. Notice, this rule isn't aimed at all people of mixed Indian-European ancestry. It's aimed specifically at children who have a white father and an Indian mother. The Lieutenant Governor wants Indian women and children to be abandoned by their white husbands or fathers. Having the father and mother separate is not good enough. He wants the family completely broken up. If the white father doesn't leave and stay away, those Indian women will watch their children being excluded from the ceremonial giving of presents by the settler government. No half-breed shall receive presents who does not live in the tribe and under the control of the chief to whose tribe he belongs. The presents he's talking about are not pretty little trinkets. They're very important. They're meant to acknowledge the nationhood of First Nations people and to symbolize a renewal of the alliance between First Nation governments and the settler government. By 1842, the presents also had great economic importance for First Nations people who were struggling to survive. The list on the left from the 1830s includes axes, brass kettles for cooking, rifles, fish hooks, clothing for each person. The list on the right is from the 1840s at, and it includes all kinds of materials for making clothes, sewing supplies, awls, butcher knives, gunpowder, etc. These are examples of the types of items that were distributed, equipment and supplies. Let's go back to rule number two for a minute. No half-breed shall receive presents who does not live in the tribe and under the control of the chief to whose tribe he belongs. Who is the Lieutenant Governor referring to in this rule? Is he talking about people of mixed ancestry, meaning they have a white ancestor somewhere in their family tree? Or is he still aiming the rule only at people who are half white 
and half Indian. That's one of the problems with the word half-breed. In historical records, the meaning of that word is not always clear. We do know this. There's nothing in the Lieutenant Governor's rules that says half-breeds are not Indians. In fact, the Lieutenant Governor believes that half-breeds belong with their tribes. Here's what Indian Superintendent Anderson wrote after he explained the Lieutenant Governor's rules. With instructions of this kind, and the presents being issued to small bands, as they are at Drummond Island and Penetanguishene, I do not apprehend any difficulty in preventing the improper class of half-breeds from receiving presents at Manitoulin Island and Penetanguishene. The improper class of half-breeds, meaning the ones whose white fathers are still hanging around. It's not being a half-breed that is cause for concern. It's the influence of white people that the settler government wants half-breeds to avoid. As long as their white father is not in the picture anymore, and as long as they're not living in white communities, half-breeds will be treated the same as other Indians. In 1849, a surveyor named Alexander Vidal and Indian Superintendent Thomas G. Anderson were sent to discuss a treaty with the chiefs along the shores of Lake Superior and Huron. In their report to the settler government, Vidal and Anderson brought up the issue of half-breed Indians. They said excluding half-breeds from a treaty would be an injustice to some of them. They asked how will government be able to tell the difference between full-bloods and half-breeds? Many half-breeds are closely connected with their bands, and some have political influence within them. They noted that it might be nearly impossible to separate the half-breeds from the full-bloods. They also pointed out that a great number of half-breeds had already been recognized as Indians through the presence given to them by the government at the annual distribution. The commissioners also said, we do not consider that the circumstances should exclude them from sharing in any annuity that the British government may give to their brethren. The government's negotiator, W. B. Robinson, knew that government officials refused to address assertions of Indian title by half-breeds. He knew that that issue was going to be raised. During the treaty negotiations in Sault Ste. Marie, he was questioned repeatedly about the half-breeds entitlement to land in the area. And finally, he said, claims by half-breeds will not be addressed. They should petition the government for land just as other subjects do. But the settler government will not object if half-breeds receive a share of the annuities through the chiefs who were parties to the treaty. This is similar to what Lieutenant Governor John Colborne said in 1842 about half-breeds receiving Indian presents only if they are living with their tribes. In this case, Robinson said, government will not listen to land claims made by half-breeds, but will have no objection if half-breeds are band members receiving a share of treaty annuities through the chiefs who are parties to the treaty. Well, government did accept land claims made by more than one half-breed 
during those treaty negotiations. Government also didn't live up to that statement about not objecting to half-breeds being band members. That changed when treaty Indians did not die off the way some people thought they would. But that's a story for another time. In 1851, Upper and Lower Canada passed legislation defining the term Indian as any person deemed to be Aboriginal by birth or blood, any person reputed to belong to a particular band or body of Indians, any person who married an Indian or was adopted by Indians. Government officials wanted power and legal authority over all Indians. That's why they made rules to keep half-breeds under their control. And that's why their 1851 definition of Indian was so broad. Despite what the Métis Nation of Ontario says, in what is now Ontario, the word half-breed did not automatically refer to a group of people whose culture was separate and distinct from that of Indians. <laughs>